says, my eyes above what it looks like, I will only see all you promised me. And it even says at the end, something's changing in the spirit, something's breaking, I can feel it. And I feel like right now things are shifting as God's people are being awakened and God's people are being stirred in the spirit, stirred to prayer, stirred to seek the face of the Lord, that something's breaking and something's shifting as all of God's people are lifting their voices and crying out. Something's breaking. 
Yes. Thank you, Lord. Exodus 33, 7 through 11. 
Exodus 33, 7 through 11. I've, um, I've been just sort of skipping through the Bible, reading different things because I can't quite get a focus of what I want to study. I'm studying, you know, what the gifts of the Spirit. I'm working on all that still. But I, I'm like, God, where do you want me to go? And I felt he led me to this scripture, and I, I didn't really know why, except that Malachi has been studying this in, um, in our Bible class at homeschool. But when I read this scripture, something jumped out at me that I'd never noticed before. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of the cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now we'll stop right there. I've read that. Y'all know that story. If you know the Bible, you know that story. If you're new to the Bible, you might not have heard that. And it's a really, really cool story. That Moses would go and talk to God. Just like I'm talking to y'all right now. He'd just go talk to God that way, face to face. And there would be a pillar of a cloud that would come down. And God, oh God, he was in that cloud. Moses was talking. I've read that many times and thought, wow. It's the next part of this verse that really stood out to me. I don't know why I've never noticed it. I'm going to start back with uh, verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. I don't know about you, but that hits me with like a bolt of the Holy Ghost when I read that. And it stood out to me and made me want to just jump up off my bed when I read it that morning. Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. The Hebrew usage of that verb actually means he would not depart. Would not in other words, I don't know if Moses will say, well, come on, we're done. You know, probably not, because Moses would have let God do his thing. But some people would have been thinking, okay, that's, that's good. Moses just talked to God face to face. He's going to come back and tell the children of Israel now what they need to know. Come on, come on, Joshua. But Joshua would not leave the tabernacle. Now, he was not even the one who had been there talking to God face to face. But you know, he heard it. Because everybody else stood back at their tent door. But Joshua went with Moses to the door of the tabernacle, and you know he felt whew, more keenly what was going on than even the people back at their tent doors. And, and then he wouldn't leave. He stayed there. I feel something about that. I felt when I read that, I said, God, make, I want to be like that. God, make me like that. Make God, I want to be that type of worshiper that I don't want to leave your presence. That doesn't mean I stay at the well 24-7. You know I'm not telling you that. Some of you still can go to work. Some of you have been told to go work at home now. But you still have things you have to do. But I want us to have the heart of Joshua to say, I don't want to depart from the glory of the Lord. I don't ever want to depart from the glory of the Lord. I want to stay there. I will not leave. I will not leave. That's what I feel that God was speaking to me last night to tell you all is that this is the kind of heart we need to pray for. Now, I've noticed that things happening here at the well, oh God, are revving up, so to speak. We're all thinking about putting up the tent. You know, there were people here yesterday, thank God, that the windows got clean. Thank you all for the cleaning. I mean, things, things got cleaned in this place. Uh, the fence, there's things going on. Uh, I just got to thank everybody that helped. I got to thank you for sowing. You sowing grass. Nobody even asked 
asking to when he's sowing grass out there where we need grass and mowed the yard and shoveled the dirt that was at the road into the boxes. Things are happening. I have a feeling that some of y'all come do things I don't even know about, which is great. I have a feeling you put that sign back up out there when you get the window. Am I right? I thought you somebody came and put that sign up. I was like, who did that? I gotta thank you all for everything that you're doing. And if you can't get here to do anything, I know you're praying. I know that you're still unified with us. So I see things here ramping up. If I'm not mistaken, that fountain's still going, am I right? Um, if we, if we get enough sunlight. That's... That fountain's been sitting there a year. We couldn't figure out what to do, how to fix it, couldn't find instructions. He comes yesterday and gets it working. Sends it to me in his own picture and said, it's not Niagara Falls, but it's working. <laughs> <laughs> that meant something to me, somehow spiritually, just getting that fountain working. I had to figure out if there's anything spiritual about that tree falling back there, but if you haven't seen that tree that fell, you need to go look. That's like a freak of nature, that big tree back there. Just fell in the night at some point, maybe Thursday night. Fell on the junk cars back there. But the guy next door was so kind, he said, I'm going to cut that tree up. Don't y'all worry about that. I got it. We'll help you, I said. He said, no, we're good. I'm telling you, God is, is, is beginning to move in such a way that I'm feeling a unity in the body I've never felt in my life. Worldwide, definitely, but right here, yes. My friend Caroline Rutledge Armijo, her daddy's Jerry Rutledge here in town, the lawyer. Most people know that name. Help her, she needs it. <laughs> Caroline messaged me last night. She won't mind me telling you this. She was in a little bit of a panic. She has at this time, foot, uh, somebody help me say it, hand, hand foot, foot mouth, mouth disease. Yeah, whatever. hand foot mouth disease. You run a fever, different things. She went and got diagnosed. It wasn't corona, it was that. But she, she could feel the enemy injecting darts at her, like, what if it turns into coronavirus? What if because your immune system's down right now and you're running a fever, what if all of a sudden it turns into that? And I, I sent to her the YouTube video of Megan playing that song that the Holy Ghost gave her that she could not repeat because the Holy Ghost gave it to her that one time. It's called Song of Peace. I'm recommending that to you right now. If you get in any kind of fear or anything, it's a four or five minute song. Go listen to it. It shows views of Wanna Code to the Holy Ghost music that he gave right here. But I sent that to her. And she came back and said, I, I immediately felt peace. She even had a, a temperature that was up to 102.9. I said, well, we're going to rebuke that fever and tell it to go down. She said that after we prayed that and she loves listening to that song, her temperature dropped two degrees right then. Mm -hmm. Boom, drop. She wasn't taking anything to drop it. It dropped. But I'm saying that to you because I'm not just telling you a story about a lady. She said to me, I find it interesting that now we have a mandatory Lent. Well, I had not thought of that. Uh, we, have, we have almost a mandatory Lent. Now, Lent is voluntary every year. It still is as far as fasting and stuff, but in a sense, we've been put under an involuntary Lent. Now, if you don't know what Lent is, it is a 40-day uh, period that I mentioned a while ago, 46 for the, for the Catholics and a lot of the church world, that began in early, early Christian days. Do I proclaim it as a biblical thing? I don't because I can't find it in the Bible. Is it a good thing for you to do? Sure. Anytime you fast and draw nigh to God, that's a good thing. But Lent comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word. Those are the people that were in England, you know, orig uh, not originally maybe, but at one point. The Anglo-Saxons... It comes from a word, Lincoln, which means simply spring. That's where the word comes from. But some of the earliest church fathers actually wrote about Lent. So it was going on a long, long time ago, uh, 200 A.D. even. People were writing about Lent. And it was a time, this is what I feel to tell you by the Spirit of God, it was a time that people prepared themselves the way Jesus did before the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You prepare yourself. That's why it comes right before what the world calls Easter. I don't really like the term Easter. It's a pagan term. You can call it that and it's okay. But Resurrection Day. So it is a time before Resurrection Day that people prepare themselves. I feel the Holy Ghost. You, we prepare ourselves. We try to purify ourselves through fasting. Not that you're trying to make yourself good by your works. It's all the blood of Jesus, but that's what you're building toward when you actually do say, I'm going to deny myself 
And I'm going to worship you and I'm going to take this 40, 46 day period and I'm going to focus on you more than I focus on sports, more than I focus on Facebook, more than I focus on movies, more than I focus on hanging out with friends. I'm going to focus on you, Jesus, because just as he, during the time before he was crucified, dead and buried and resurrected, before that time, what he did was prepared himself <coughs> by going up to Jerusalem. You never go down to Jerusalem. You go up to Jerusalem. Oh, God, you go up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a city set upon a hill. My mama's been there. I don't know who else here has been to Israel. But you go up to Jerusalem. Jesus spent the time before he knew he was going to be crucified. He spent that time preparing himself. I'm going to read you another scripture. I'm probably going to go back to that Joshua one, but I'm going to go now. To Matthew 20. Oh God, hallelujah. Matthew 20, 17 through 18. Matthew 20, 17 through 18. This, when you get to the end of Matthew here, when you get to the 20s of chapters, you start to talk about getting close to the crucifixion. You get close to when it all goes down. Verse 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. It says it twice in those two verses, that phrase, up to Jerusalem. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart of the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. Now, I've preached about this before, some of these terms when you talk about going up to Jerusalem. But I want to talk about it just a little bit more. Now, when you go up to Jerusalem, the word Jerusalem, you know, we say it like I just said, Jerusalem. In Hebrew, it's like Yerushalayim. Ooh, that, you just say it like that and just, ooh, Yerushalayim. It comes from two Hebrew words. It comes from Yara Shalom. Ooh, God. Yara Shalom. And you put them together, Yara Shalom, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. Now, it means something so significant, and I've, I've told you this for the last two years, but some of y'all weren't here, and you need to hear it. We all do. Yara is the Hebrew word for to teach or to point somebody in the direction of something. It, Hebrew words have a uh, something tangible to give you a picture of them. So it doesn't, I, can't, I can just say it means to teach. But the Hebrew gives you a tangible picture. It shows you somebody pointing to where they want to shoot the arrow. You know, I don't know if that's good form. I, used to, I took archery in college, believe it or not, but I don't remember. But you know, something like that, you know, you're holding it, and you got the arrow here at the knot, and you're looking, you're looking exactly to where you want to shoot that arrow. That's what the word teach, yada, means. That you're, you're pointing to exactly where you want to hit. And then they take it and it, it uh, morphs into the word teach. You teach people where to go. You teach people what to do. You show them where they're supposed to point that arrow to go straight to the heart of the bullseye. That's what that word means. The second part of Jerusalem, you've already heard, yara, yara. Shalom. What does that sound like? Shalom. Shalom. They're very kin. They're from the same root. The word shalom means that you, you take people and show them how to be whole. You take people and you show them how to be at peace because shalom means so much more than just uh, hello, goodbye. We used to sing this song in Bible school at Christ Temple. I don't know who I was there. Uh, we say shalom. We say shalom. You know, it was kind of like a greeting. We say shalom when we say hello. We say shalom. We say goodbye. And that's all sweet and good like, hey, how you doing? Shalom. Sounds kind of cool, shalom. But here's the thing. It's so much more than that. Shalom. It's total wholeness. It's total peace. So when you look at somebody and you say, Shalom, Kelsey, Shalom, Josh, Shalom, James, what you're saying there is you're saying, I, I bid you to go in total peace. I bid you to go in total wholeness. I bid you to go in total health. I bid you to go in total safety. I see you. I say, Shalom. Hey, how you doing? Shalom. Here you come to me in total peace. Here you come to me in total wholeness. Here you come to me totally healed and cured of everything that was besetting you and afflicting you. Here you come in Shalom. This word Shalom is more of a forceful means 
of getting that shalom out there. In other words, you're teaching people your yada shalom. You're teaching people and pointing them the way to total peace. What a time we are living in right now that it is our job as the people of God to point people the way to total peace. And I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about all of us who know Him. We can point people the way to total peace. I don't mean by banging them on the head and saying, what's wrong with you? Why are you so scared of this coronavirus? Don't you know God's got us? What's your problem? What are you going to do for them like that? You're not going to do a thing for them like that. It is time for us to, with kindness and compassion and the love of God, point people the way to peace. So it's time for us, as he did, to go up to Jerusalem, to go up to the place where we, Yara Shalom, the people out there who are in panic and who need the peace of God. I felt this so strongly, and when Caroline said that to me, she said, we're in a mandatory Lent. We got no NCAA tournament. This is called March Madness. People put memes on Facebook saying, well, it's March Sadness now. You know, there's no March Madness. Well, and then Alan or somebody told me yesterday, said, well, it really is a March Madness going on throughout the world. But not for us. Not supposed to be for us. March Madness, as far as basketball, is done. I felt a little grief, I'm going to be honest with you. When we were sitting there and Alan said, just think, we'd be sitting here watching the AC, ACC tournament final. I'm like, wow, we would, wouldn't we? You know, I had to battle that just a little bit. If you don't love basketball, you don't know what I mean, but I love basketball, and I had to battle that just a little bit. I'm going to be honest with you. Can I be transparent? I'm not going to stand up here and act like I'm all that, and I'm telling you lowly people what to do. When Lou Winkle called this 40-day fast, I'm like, yep, I'm in as much as I can. May not, you know, go without food 40 days, but I'm in. And then he said, this time I want to see who all can give up a lot of things, like sports. Who can give up TV? And I literally said to my husband, I'll do what I can on this little angle fast, but I'm not giving up March Madness, I said. Yeah, I said it. I'm being transparent. I said that. I'm not giving up March Madness. Now, if God really tells me to, I will. But just Lou Engle saying it, maybe. I mean, I love Lou Engle. But uh, I'm not giving up March Madness. You know, I'll at least watch that, but I'll go without food some, but I'll, I'll watch basketball. Because I said to Alan, I said, it's once a year. I said, if this was August and Lou Engle was doing 40 days without basketball, now, see, you can't, if, you're, if you don't like basketball, you're going, that is so stupid. Why in the world? But think of something you absolutely love and you wait for once a year. And it only comes once a year. And you wait for it because you can't only wait. Well, that's the way I look at March. And so all of a sudden when they canceled it, I'm sad for the teams. I'm sad for the seniors that will never play those games. I'm sad. That's heartbreaking. <laughs> Some of them have been waiting their whole lives to get to this one shining moment as they play at the games. But you know what I felt for me? Me personally only, I thought, serves me right. There we go. I mean, really, for me, I'm thinking, it's gone. I didn't want to give it up, but it's gone anyway. <laughs> for me, personally. We got a whole lot that's been taken from us right now. Italy, I think, no, actually Bulgaria, shut down their businesses. You can be fine if you go to a business. They've left some key ones open, some food supply type things, pharmacies. But... You can be fined if you go to these businesses. They're shut down. Ain't no going to the movies. Now, you'd still go to the ground this week if you want to, I think. But these countries are shutting this stuff down. There's a mandatory Lent, in a sense, where everything is taken. Now, are you, do you can you still work with the children? Yeah, we're still Okay. I didn't know how daycares are doing. I didn't. So they could, couldn't they? So states could even tell daycares to shut down. The schools has already been, we told you that. What are you going to do with this time? I've been seeing it on Facebook. People are doing a, to saying a lot of things from the flesh. Man, I can't wait. What show should I binge watch? Somebody give me some ideas of some good shows to binge watch. Show me what I can do. Boy, we're going to sleep. We're gonna, there's nothing wrong with some of these things, but... This is a time, y'all take, we got to take advantage of this. We got to move toward God. We got to go up to Jerusalem, not only for everybody else, but for ourselves. I'm not saying this is a good thing that this is sweeping the globe. No. But what I'm saying is, and we know, we know with all things, 
work together for good to them that love God who are the called according to his purpose. All Amen. things can work Amen. together for good. We can in my whole God. We could emerge from this time of quarantine, so to speak. So moving in the pool, so moving in the power of God, like we would have never done, like Leslie would have never done had there been basketball games being played. That she was going to stay up and watch every night till 1 a.m. when the West Coast quit playing. I'd have never done what I feel like I need to do now. My hand's been forced, sort of. So is yours. What will you do with the time? I feel like I wish I could look at every single one. We've got a small crowd. I can look at every single one of you in the eye and say, what are you going to do with this time? Make the most of it for God. You're living in a key time right now to make the most of this time to fast if you feel led to fast, to pray, to worship, to study that word, to go forth and bless others. Every time there was a call, there was a concentrated fast in the Bible, that's when people went forth out of that fast in power and anointing. Moses had two 40-day <coughs> fasts in a row. You know, I had forgotten that. Two of them. I knew he had one. But he went up on the mountain. Moses went up to Mount Sinai. And you know what happened there. There's God. Can you imagine? Oh, I can't even imagine with those tablets of stone and the finger of God comes down and writes on those tablets of stone right there before you. Moses was there for 40 days and 40 nights. There was no food involved. The Bible says there was not even water because he was in such a manifest presence of God that he didn't even need the carnal things. Now, you remember when he came down off the mountain, the people had persuaded Aaron to make the golden calf, and they were dancing around it. And that's when Moses came down, and in anger, he threw the tablets down, and they broke. He had to go back. God told him, he said, come back to the mountain. And when he went back to the mountain again, he went 40 days, no food, no water, 40 days in the presence of God. Now you say, well, what did that do for him? When he came down, oh God, when he came down off that mountain, they couldn't even look at him. They tried to look at him and his face was glowing and shining with the presence of God because he had been right there in the manifest presence of God. He had to put a veil over his face because people just couldn't even hardly look at him. That's what happens, people of God. That's what can happen right now when we have this time to draw away without the distractions. That's what can happen. When he called me last night, Abigail had first messaged me and she said, Mom, pray for a revival right now. I didn't see that until like an hour or two later. I wasn't looking at my computer and I didn't see it. And then Elijah called me. He said, Mom, revival is happening now. Revival is now. People of God, I'm telling you, revival is now. You're not waiting on it. You're not waiting for the future and saying, oh God, we pray you move. When are you going to move, God? I'm telling you, God is moving right now and all he's waiting on is us. He's waiting on us, and we've got this unprecedented opportunity with no distractions to draw nigh. When Moses came down and that face was so engulfed in the presence of God, I want to see that myself. Not just for the shock factor of it, I want to know that we've been so in the presence of God that people come near us and they, can you feel that right now? Like people just, Ooh, they come near Bonnie. She's been so in the presence of God. Just when they get near her, they just, oh, what do I feel? What do I feel right there? Because it's a tangible thing. You can't put your hands on it, but yet you can in the spirit realm. Elijah, the prophet Elijah, he had just been, had that great victory. All, and all of a sudden, Jezebel, the evil Jezebel said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And he took off. I mean... You can't, you know, what can you say? He just had a great victory, but then he kind of ran away. He was scared of Jezebel. I'm not condemning him. The prophet Elijah, no way. But when he got out there, all of a sudden, an angel came to him. Because he was about to give up. He was possibly even feeling suicidal. I've heard some preachers say like he was ready to give up. And an angel came to him and, and had, gave him a cake and gave him some drink. And the Bible says Elijah went in the strength of that food for 40 days. He didn't have to eat again. He went 40 days. And you say, well, what'd that do for him? Because when he went in the strength of that angel food, he still wasn't exactly where God wanted him to be because that's when he went and hid in a cave and said, woe is me, I'm the only one. I'm the only one that hadn't bowed and knee to bell. Everybody else has. 
And that's when God said, wait a minute, let me talk to you. <laughs> In so many words. And there was an earthquake. There was a great wind, the different things, and Elijah was listening. But God wasn't in the earthquake, and God wasn't in the wind. All of a sudden, there came a still, small voice, and God reassured Elijah. He said, you're not alone. He said, i got thousands who haven't bowed a knee to Baal. Now get up and go. So 40 days, he went in the strength of that food, and then you know what he did when he rose up? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost to tell you, when we draw aside to God the way that we're supposed to right now, when we come out of it, you just wait. Oh, you wait till you come out of it on the other side. Because when Elijah came out on the other side, he immediately went and he anointed King Hazael, king of Syria, a pagan nation. He goes and anoints who's going to be king of the pagan nation. He goes to Yahoo and he anoints him to be king of Israel. And then he goes and he sees the, the Elisha and he anoints Elisha to come with him and become a prophet who's going to move in a double portion one day of what Elijah's moving in. He came out of that 40 days with power and anointing to go anoint kings and prophets. Oh, God is even now anointing kings in the spiritual realm and he's anointing prophets right here among you. It may be you. It's all of us. We are all priests and kings with Christ. We're seated with Him in heavenly places right now. Right now. You have been there whether you know it or not. And now we've got to take authority the way He told us to do. Jesus is the only other one we have mentioned in the Bible that went on a 40-day fast. And y'all know what happened with that. When He came out of the wilderness, that's when His ministry really began. He came out of the wilderness after 40 days of fasting and prayer. And when he came out, boom! I think the first thing that's recorded, we know he chose his disciples right after that, was he started casting out devils. When he came out of the wilderness, it was like devils be gone. Well, this coronavirus is demonic. I will never be convinced that it's anything else. I don't know who started it. I don't know exactly where it came from. I've heard of so many conspiracy <laughs> theories. Not even worried about that right now. All I know is it's a devil. We've got to take authority. At this time that we're drawing aside, we need to be so close to God that when we come out, we're moving in a power we never knew before. What if the whole, what if the whole Christian world did this? What if the whole Christian world drew together right now in unity instead of getting on Facebook saying, well, I can't believe they're doing this, and I can't believe it. I think so-and-so released this virus over here, and I think that President Trump did this, and you cynical Democrats shouldn't say, stop this stuff. What are we doing? Let's get away from all this stuff and seek God and see what God would have us do and what God would have us say and how God would have us act. Because that's the only thing that's going to make a difference. You've seen the Facebook memes that say stuff like what Corona means. It means crown. And it's like, it's like people are saying the devil's trying to come and take authority over Jesus with this coronavirus, which is a crown virus. He's not, he's not going to take authority over you. He cannot. Mm -hmm. And he can only take authority in our lives with what we give him. He's not, he's not got all power anymore. Jesus came and took back what the devil stole in the garden. And he said, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. And then what did he tell us? He said, I'm getting ready to go away and leave you. He said, but what I want you to do now is wait and tarry till you be endued with power. To go forth and oh God to go forth in the world endued with power. We got an involuntary Lent going on right now. We got a we got a mandatory Lent going on right now. Friday, as Megan starts playing that anointed music music to get us back in the flow before we ended out here. Friday, I was seeking the Lord big time <coughs> because I was like, God, I, I got to have an answer here about Warrior Fest. We've gone for the last three years, I think. I said, God, what, what do we do? I had been feeling since January that we weren't going. I, I told my kids and my husband, I said, I'm not just feeling like maybe I'm not supposed to go. I'm supposed to stay here. But I knew that he has these kids who had been looking forward to it. And I didn't want to, you know, come against that. So I spent Friday just, I went in my room at lunchtime and just started praying and seeking God. God, show me what to do. i got to have an answer. I personally don't even want to go anymore because I feel like here is where I'm needed. That might just be me. What do we do, God? And 
and all of a sudden he spoke clearly to me. I mean, it wasn't an audible voice. I heard Ezra 1, 3. Now, I can't tell you what's in the first chapter of Ezra. I, I, no clue. To be honest, I was a teeny bit thinking, is that really good? Because Ezra, the first few chapters, is probably genealogies. So-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so. And what's that got to do with anything? But I obeyed and went and turned to it. And here's what it says. Ezra 1, verse 3. Who is among you? of all his people. May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. Every, that's the exact scripture. I didn't put in anything like that. He is God. That's in the scripture. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. As soon as I read that, that was like it. I'm like, I'm here. Now, if everybody else wants to go to Warrior Fest, I'm cool with it. Go, and I'll bless you to go. But me, I'm here. Because I'm needed here. Let us go up to Jerusalem. Let us go up to Yerushalayim to teach people the way of peace, to point people the way to peace, which is Him. He's the Prince of Peace. Years ago when I would intercede for this town, one day I was in prayer with some other saints up the street here. 2006, I believe it was. And I was praying and I heard God tell me to start calling Walnut Cove by a new name. And the name that came to me was Zion, which is Zion. And I said, but God, Jerusalem is Zion. You know, the holy city. And he said, every city on the face of the earth should be a type of of Jerusalem. Oh God, Jerusalem is this original city set upon a hill, but every city should be a type of Jerusalem, a type of Zion. So I started calling Wana Cove, Zion Wana Cove from that time. I pray every day now and pray for God, the peace of, first I pray for the peace of Jerusalem first. Then I pray for the peace of Zion Wana Cove. That day in prayer, when we were done, a lady came to me and said, you're supposed to, there's something you've got about Wanna Cove today. There's like a new name. There's something you're supposed to have. I said, absolutely. God just showed it to me. So when I read something like Ezra 1-3 and it says, let us go up to Jerusalem and build the house of the Lord because He is God. People of God, it's time for us to continue building what God's told us to build here. And I'm not talking about a building fund necessarily to go build a, a physical building, although that'll be part of it, I think. I'm talking about what he's building here among this body of Christ. It's time for us to go up to Jerusalem, point people the way to peace, and to continue and hasten even the building of what he's called us to do here spiritually. What are you going to do with this time? What are you going to do with it? You got video games, you got computer games, you got Facebook, you got Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, <coughs> you got movies. You got all kinds of things you can do that sound fun. And if you fill all your time with that, it's just like you decided that you had a two-week period that you was going to eat Doritos and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups and drink Dr. Peppers and all that sounds real good to me that loves that stuff. But if you did that for two weeks, you are messing yourself up. And if you take this time and you just fill yourself with the things of the world and pleasure, Spiritually, we're messing ourselves up. Did you feel anything to say from God? Is there anything that you've heard? Tell us. When they were singing or whatever, I just... Because last night, when I went up to the upper room, I was praying and I was like, God, I'm interceding. And I wasn't mad at God, but I was like, You told us to keep present, but I keep asking, and we'll receive it, and I was like, I'm, I've gotten rid of all video games, I've gotten rid of a lot of social media, except for Instagram and YouTube, mainly so I can just record what he's doing, right, so the world can see it, and I said, I'm giving up everything, and I said, and I'll continue to keep pushing, praying until something happens, but 
I just told him, I said, like this book that I've been reading, the Christian Strider book, revival can happen anytime, anywhere, with anyone. And I said, I want it to happen now. And I prayed that, and I said, I'm not leaving here until something happens. And that's when I came down here, and then everybody fell out in the spirit. And it happened again this morning. It was just like, I was like a magnet. Before it was a magnet. God was just like, boom. And I fell out. And God spoke to me. He said, this move of me happening to you and everyone around you seems rare. This should be common, and this is your new common. This is your normal. Give your all to me, and I will pour it out on you. And I saw it happening everywhere. Just everywhere we, everywhere I would go. Just seeing people and just like walking near them. And then they just like go and hit them in grocery stores and gas stations. Everywhere. People just falling out. And I know it's going to happen because it already happened here. And it's like, it's the beginning. It's, this is what it is. Say that about your new common? How did he say that? He said, This move of me happening to you and everyone around you seems rare. This should be common, and this is your new common. This is your normal. Give your all to me, and I will pour it out. You've got to say there's a new. 